Hello, I'm Sami Zaydan. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, economy is opening up despite the pandemic as debts head towards World War II levels. Could we see austerity or stimulus? And when is the right time to pay down debt? As economies tank and job losses increase, the Nasdaq hits a record high. Are stock markets divorced from reality? Or are we seeing a tech divide between the profitable and loss-making? And the pandemic has been particularly devastating for indigenous people across Latin America. We look at how they're fighting back. Now, the full brutal impact of the coronavirus pandemic was laid bare when Britain became the first G20 nation to release economic data. In the first full month of the lockdown, the economy tanked a staggering 20% in April. Britain is heading towards the worst recession in 300 years. The consequences for economies and jobs could have been worse without rich nations spending trillions of dollars to limit the damage. In Britain, the government is expected to spend $60 billion from March to October on paying 80% of salaries of furloughed workers. The scheme is currently supporting 8.7 million jobs, or a third of all working people. India announced a $266 billion stimulus. Most of it, though, was geared towards the financial sector. There's little support for the 120 million people who've lost their jobs. And in the United States, up to $3 trillion has been spent on various programs. That includes checks for each adult worth $1,200. Well, that's likely to push the debt-to-GDP ratio to 107% by 2025. That's more than the debt it held after World War II. The big question is, how do we begin to pay down these huge debts? Leaders of some of the poorest parts of the UK are concerned they won't cope if the government reintroduces austerity cuts after the lockdown. Lawrence Lee has more from Middlesbrough in northeastern England. What will things be like when it's all over? For rich places, maybe not so bad. But poor communities have a right to be worried. The post-industrial landscape of Teesside in northeastern England tells a story of joblessness, poor life chances and, during the virus, a high mortality rate. If the British government tries to pay off its huge debts through austerity, then they can't begin to imagine how much worse things will get. It's, it's almost too difficult to comprehend how we would go about doing that because we're, I think we're at the, as low as we can get in terms of the, the cuts that we've made. I can't, I can't even start to think about how we would make more cuts. First-hand experiences of all this show a town already on the edge. Binney delivers vital supplies to 17 people with underlying health conditions and therefore most at risk. In this tiny house of four asylum seekers, including an elderly woman from Sierra Leone who has diabetes. Given the things Binney has seen, any more cuts to services would be catastrophic. But there was a case right here in Middlesbrough, central Middlesbrough, someone who did not eat for 17 days. 17 days? For 17 days. So she has been going over um, food banks. She saw the food banks were closed. And uh, even though she is fully entitled as, uh, as, as a citizen, um, but she was um, looked at, uh, you know, overlooked. And she was almost going to die. Disease thrives in poverty. The economic response to the healthcare crisis will make or break places like this. Just before all this started, the new British government swept to power on a promise of what it called levelling up, ploughing money into the forgotten English northern towns. But not only has COVID-19 put all of that on ice, it's also led to a new enormous national debt, a debt which towns like Middlesbrough are in no position whatsoever to help pay back. The story here could be that of any poor town in any country which has taken on massive debt. Nationally or globally, that, that will happen. We will lose generations, we will lose businesses, people will lose hope. hope. The health and social implications will be colossal. The, it, it isn't an option. Borrowing at these new affordable rates prudently and spending intelligently is the only solution to this. So many of the problems here predated the virus, but maybe the healthcare crisis could have a silver lining after all. Better jobs, stronger communities surely mean 
healthier people. Lawrence Lee, Al Jazeera, Middlesbrough. Well, let's take a deeper dive into debt and what to do about it. I'm delighted to have with us Ian Randolph, Director of Sovereign Risk at IHS Markets. He joins us via Skype from London. Good to have you with us, Jan. So after spending big, of course, comes the hard part. How do you unwind debt without hurting jobs and the economy? It's a tricky one. Um, we are faced with an unprecedented situation. Um, global economy has basically crashed. Um, we're forecasting minus 3% global growth this year. Um, that means governments will lose revenues, tax revenues, and budget deficits will widen. And we will see debt levels um, as a ratio to GDP, that's public debt to GDP, top 120%. That's never happened before, except since the Second World War. That's for, for advanced economies. For developing economies, it'll be just under 40% to just over 60%. So there's a huge increase in debt in order to finance those deficits that have widened. And it will leave a lingering burden. Uh, the key question is, how will governments service this debt? Uh, will it become a problem? Will it create crises? Will it undermine growth in years to come? Those are the big questions. Well, how do you think that governments then will unwind? I don't want to make you look into your crystal ball, but um, I mean, what are the, the options out there? Well, so far, so far, governments have been able to borrow new money new, uh, from uh, their own central banks. That's quantitative easing. And it's not just uh, in the developed world. Developing countries are also engaging in their own quantitative easing. Uh, where they borrow from their own central banks. Uh, that assumes, of course, that there is um, uh, domestic savings and they can borrow in their own currency. Uh, so can they go on endlessly borrowing from central banks? Well, it, it could go on. It, it, it depends how it's managed. That's the risk profile here. Um, to the extent that, one, governments can borrow very long term at very low interest rates, um, that basically spreads the burden over many, many years, even decades. Um, that will tend to make it easier for them to debt service. They need to lock into these very low interest rates uh, and lengthen the maturity, the average maturity of their debt. The more they can do that, the more they can spread the burden over many, many years. But it's not a free lunch. Um, debt will increase and it will have to be paid back one way or another and it will begin to undermine growth in years to come. So it's not a free lunch, uh, but they can manage it if they manage it sensibly. The other key question is investors. The, 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 you know, the, the commercial world, as well as the central banks, will the commercial banks and other investors, are they willing to buy up this new debt? Um, and for that, it really is about confidence in the macroeconomic policies of each government, the monetary policy and the fiscal policy, whether they're seen as responsible. Uh, everyone, most economists agree that now is the time for governments to spend to support the, uh, support the economy, because we do need that growth to come back. We need to rekindle growth, because ultimately, uh, growth will deliver all the taxes in order to help the debt servicing. So it's very important now that governments do support growth, um, because ultimately, we can only grow out of the debt with growth. And that was going to be precisely the point I was going to raise is about the confidence, given what you said earlier about the debt to GDP ratio going up. And if you take the case of the world's largest economy, the United States of America, well, they're looking at 117 percent by 2025. You know, how is that going to impact on confidence, investor confidence? Well, the conf it's, it's, it throws the question back. Do we have confidence in the American monetary and fiscal systems? Um, by and large, we do. The U.S. Federal Reserve, the central bank, has um, done extraordinary measures to provide liquidity into the markets. Um, that's also spilt over into the emerging markets. Um, that's all helped to provide the money um, in order for governments to borrow. So that's helped support risk assets. But for the U.S., it's a question of whether they can get growth coming back again. Um, when we reflect back on the end of the Second World War, which is where we are at similar levels in terms of debt ratios, just over 120 percent on average, uh, a little less for some countries, a little bit more for others like Italy, um, they, 
in the 50s and 60s and 70s, the debt ratios came down. But what helped there was, of course, um, growth recoveries after the Second World War. Uh, that was very important in bringing those debt ratios down. We, we hope for a similar scenario this time round, where we can rekindle growth to help bring back down those debt ratios. Um, also, what happened in the 60s and 70s, we had inflation. Um, and inflation also helped a lot in terms of bringing those debt levels down. But inflation is one of the key things that investors will look at uh, because they will be put off. Uh, they will lose credibility in, in, in the eyes of investors if governments start stoking inflation. Advocates, I want you to, to look at it from the perspective of advocates for the modern monetary theory who say we can go on spending unlimited amounts of money. Do they have a point? Well, it depends who you ask, which monetarist. If you ask a German monetarist, um, typically those that inhabit the Bundesbank uh, and, uh, and similar central banks, they would be horrified at the idea of governments borrowing from directly from their central bank because their, their experience in the 1930s was that, that this led to a runaway inflation, which decimated savings, and you had the polarization of politics, which ended up in the Second World War. So they would be horrified uh, at the idea that governments could borrow indefinitely from their central bank. Uh, it would create problems if it led to inflation. All right, thanks so much. Jan Randolph there. Thank you. New U.S. sanctions against the Syrian government have gone into effect. They target any person or entity who does business with those close to President Bashar al-Assad. The Caesar Act, as it's known, is aimed at increasing the economic isolation of Assad's regime. It also affects countries seeking to do business with Syria's government. The sanctions are expected to derail the regime's post-war recovery plans. Al Jazeera's Zain Khuda reports from Beirut. We should warn viewers, you may find some of the images to be disturbing. They're known as Caesar's photographs, named after a military defector who documented torture and killings in Syrian government jails. His testimonies to the U.S. Congress was part of a campaign to hold the regime responsible for what have been described as war crimes. It led to the passing and now the implementation of a bill in the U.S., the so-called Caesar Act. Any country in the world, um, if there's a company, individual, uh, entity that's providing technology, financial support, uh, mi military support to the Assad regime are all liable for sanctions under the Caesar bill. These sanctions go further than existing ones. They're aimed at preventing international engagement with Bashar al-Assad's government. Partnering or fighting on its side will also be punishable. The Syrian government calls the legislation economic terrorism, but proponents of the law point to exemptions that minimize any impact on civilians. The Syrian government is allowed to buy medicines if they want, but they don't want to spend the, uh, the foreign currency on that. They want to fund their war machine. They want to fund the militias. Human rights groups have accused the Syrian government of using aid to fund its atrocities, benefit those loyal to it, and punish opponents by confiscating their properties. Plans to move to a post-war phase in Syria will now be difficult. This law is different than it's more uh, comprehensive. Uh, so you'll have uh, basically a halt on all the official uh, reconstruction in Syria moving forward. And this will definitely have an impact on, on the regime. It's already faced with a collapsing economy and currency. There is unprecedented poverty. Some say Assad hasn't been this vulnerable at any time during the nine-year war. It kind of shuts the door um, fully closed um, in terms of there being any light at the end of the tunnel for the Syrian regime. So I think politically and diplomatically that will have an impact. But it adds on to the already terrible effect of the, of the Syrian economic crisis. Assad has faced pressure in the past but has never agreed to making political concessions. He's since declared victory in the war in Syria. And while he may have won militarily, winning the peace may prove harder. The new legislation means the fight for Damascus as the seat of Assad's power and legitimacy has still to be fought. Zena Khudar El Jazeera, Beirut. The tech-heavy Nasdaq hit a record high earlier this month, turning around a 40% deficit on the year. 
It wasn't alone. Markets have staged a remarkable recovery, totally detached from the economic reality of the pandemic. A large factor in the rise has been so-called retail or non-professional investors. They've taken to speculating or gambling because many sports events have been struck off. Still, the big winners during the pandemic are Amazon, Google, Facebook, Apple and Tesla. But not all techs are alike. Some have been going through a rough patch. Some poor bets from SoftBank's $100 billion vision fund resulted in a $17.7 billion loss. That was the worst in the company's 39-year history. You may remember Saudi Arabia lent it a huge chunk of money to invest in the likes of WeWorks and Uber. Uber posted a loss of $2.9 billion in the first quarter. That's its biggest loss in three quarters. It has since cut 6,700 jobs, closed offices around the world and plans to sell off some of its businesses. It shouldn't surprise you, it had an 80% drop in the number of people booking rides. Well, joining me now from New York via Skype is Daniel Ives. Daniel is the Managing Director of Equity Research at New York-based Webbush Securities. Good to have you with us. So what's pushing up the markets to record levels? Is there some sound economic basis for this confidence or is it just investors looking to speculate? Yeah, if, if you look, this has really been a tech-led rally with SANG names really leading the way. You know, a lot of it is about what's happening in this COVID environment. It's really accelerated the cloud cybersecurity, and even on the consumer side, streaming and e-commerce. That's why you continue to see FANG names like Amazon, Apple, you know, Google, and Facebook going continue to go much higher. You know, in my opinion, tech's going to continue to lead this rally further. And I think investors are looking on the other side, the dark valley, for where stock should be in terms of 2021 numbers. But I think it's really right now, a, we'll call it a glass half full view, especially for tech and fang names. But it sounds like there's a, a li at least a little bit of guessing going on. Is there any risk of a bubble being created? Look, right now, I mean, if you look at normalized 2021 numbers, that's what the street's going off of. You know, if you look at the COVID-19 pandemic, the economic abyss that we're seeing right now, if that extends further out, 6, 12, 18 months, then I think you'll see valuations get hit here. So I think right now you're seeing a benefit of the doubt that this is really what we'll call a three to six month, you know, situation that ultimately gets resolved from an economic perspective in terms of a rebound as the lockdown ends. There definitely could be, you know, risk off trade here. But I think right now, you know, it continues to kind of be a freight train rolling ahead in terms of tech stocks. And what I would continue to point out, there's a lack of secular growth stories, many of them in tech. That's why you continue to see fang and work from home names going up and to the right. Is there any sense that some companies are holding off coming to the market, like Instacart, valued at $14 billion? Yeah, right now, the IPO market continues to be very rocky. And I think when you talk about Instacart and others, you know, I think right now, if you look at the appetite from an investor perspective, it's very selective in terms of IPOs. Because right now, the worry is, is that what does the growth look like? What is the sustainable growth rates? And I think right now, what you're seeing is with the IPO market at least closed for many, I think that's going to spur more M&A for a lot of these companies, both financial and strategic buyers. I think it really comes down to you need to see a rebound into the second half to see more of these IPOs come out. Is it possible, Daniel, to say a divide is emerging between if we can call them the old guard, companies like Google, Amazon, Apple, and then the likes of Uber and Airbnb? Oh, yeah. I think you could definitely say there's a divide. Because right now, if you take a step back and you look at the COVID impact, the gig economy, the Airbnbs, the Ubers, you know, the Lyfts, among others, those have been the ones that have had really the gut punch. I mean, that's where you have ridership that's down globally for Uber, 70 80%. But yet e-commerce, Amazon, massively strong. Netflix streaming. You look at Apple in terms of services. You look at engagement, social media, as well as online advertising, Google and Facebook. You know, those are stocks that continue to you know, lead the way. So I think you are seeing a divide. 
But really, I'd point out it's the gig economy right now that continues to have just a massive black cloud because of the COVID environment and health and safety concerns. All right, let me get your thoughts on SoftBank. Almost $18 billion in losses. Is it losing credibility? I think that would be an understatement. I mean, I think right now it comes down to it would hard to be fine a worse bet than some of the ones that SoftBank has made. You know, even if you were playing blindfolded darts looking for investments, I think they've lost a lot of credibility here. And I can tell you, you know, even in being in, when I was in Asia in uh, January, I think a lot of companies, when they're looking at investments in terms of VCs, they're really trying to stay away from SoftBank because of that reputational risk. So I think that's been a been a massive hit in terms of what they've taken. And obviously, the WeWork is a major black eye for SoftBank. It is indeed. Thanks so much. Daniel Lives there. Thanks for having me. The coronavirus pandemic has been particularly devastating for indigenous people across Latin America. Our Latin America editor, Lucia Newman, reports on how communities in Ecuador are defying the odds and fighting back against the pandemic. Cayambe is a lush rural community perched on the highlands of Ecuador. For centuries, it's been the agricultural service center for the capital, Quito, about an hour away. But it might as well be another world. This sign warns community under quarantine. There are 132 checkpoints in and around every single entry point. Everything is disinfected, and the indigenous community controls schedules, entrance and exits of all vehicles and people. Only a few outsiders are allowed in. A curfew from 2 p.m. till 5 a.m. is strictly enforced. It's now 2 p.m. and the town is closed till tomorrow. You must understand that the Andean indigenous people have their own philosophy, their own cosmo vision, language and culture that's applied to our struggle for land, water and self-preservation. We're also applying it now to the pandemic. Those who disobey by breaking curfew or other irresponsible behavior are submitted to indigenous justice. These young men are being punished with 8 to 16 hours of community work. It can include everything from cleaning this plaza to public toilets. It's a moral sanction meant to embarrass them before the community. The police sometimes hands them over to us and we assign the punishment. The results are impressive. In this community of 120,000, there hasn't been a single death from COVID-19. Nothing short of miraculous in the country with the highest death toll per capita in Latin America. Cayambe is nevertheless suffering on account of the pandemic. It's famous for its roses, one of Ecuador's main exports. But with the world economy on lockdown, their roses have been wilting away. In Cayambe, flowers are our main source of income. Around 80% of the population lives from them. So this pandemic has hurt us badly. A few cargo planes are beginning to export their beautiful products again, albeit in small quantities. But the indigenous community likes to say that their lives will again smell like roses, as long as they continue winning the battle against the intrusive new virus. Lucia Newman, Al Jazeera. And that's our show for this week. But remember, you can get in touch with us via Twitter. Use the hashtag AJCTC when you do. Or drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. There's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That'll take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. That's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Sami Zaydan. From the whole team here, thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.